Hello, good day everyone. So for this last video for introduction to sociology, we're going to be talking about social movements and social change. So we'll talk about why these uh, social movements happen, what is the nature of a social movement, why they happen, how they happen, and how do they eventually uh, become precursors to social change. So for this video, we'll talk about collective behavior, social movements, and social change. I think uh, this is a good time for us to be able to talk about these concepts, especially that, you know, wherever we look, we see a lot of collective behavior happening. Uh, people are rallying behind certain causes, people protesting to protect rights and to be able to, you know, forward their advocacies. And uh, we see this in the Black Lives Matter movement. We see pride parades, you know. We see the protests that have been done in UP in relation to the anti-terrorism bill and uh, calls for um, calls for mass testing and better public health. We also see people on social media trying to trend um, advocacy such as the Me Too movement, etc. And uh, we're going to understand why this happens, why these things are necessary and what are the nature or what are the characteristics of social movements and why they can be effective or ineffective and how can we um, invite people to be able to uh, fight with us in certain advocacies that we're trying to lead. So first, it's important for us to define what is collective behavior. You know? When we say we have a critical mass towards a certain cause or advocacy. So it's a non-institutionalized activity in which several people voluntarily engage. So let's segmentize that definition. So first, it's non-institutionalized. So it's outside formal norms. It's also outside expected informal norms. So this is something that has to be uh, could be coined as, you know, maybe deviant behavior even, you know. So it's not something that we expect in society to happen. So it's non-institutionalized. It's non-routinized. Activity in which several people voluntarily engage. So there's a voluntary, um, tawag dito, there's a voluntary um nature to the engagement in these types of activities. So for example, when people congregate in the church, you know, in order for them to do worship in the Eucharist, um, that's not considered as a collective behavior because it's an institutionalized activity. Um, or when students go to school or, you know, a group of students go to class, we cannot consider that as a collective behavior because it's an institutionalized activity. You know, students are expected to go to school at this certain time and, you know, attend this certain lecture because that is a sanction by society. Collective behavior should be something that's out of the box, out of what's socially expected, you know, and that's why, you know, sometimes we raise our, our, our eyebrows when there are protests or rally because these are non-institutionalized behavior. This is not something that's uh, socially expected, you know, at a given, you know, daily routine. Um, and an example of a collective behavior may be a flash mob. So it's when a large group of people who gather together in a spontaneous activities that lasts a limited amount of time before returning to their regular routine. So probably you've watched a lot of flash mobs in you know in the in in YouTube and this is an example of collective behavior. Now collective behavior could be something that works towards a cause or it could be something that is just non institutionalized. It could be some su surprise or it could be celebratory in nature. Now let's also talk about you know a collective of people instead of collective behavior. You no know? so there are what we call casual crowds. So casual crowds consist of people who are in the same place at the same time but who aren't really interacting functionally such as people standing in line at the post office or those who are waiting for their turn in the uh, jeepney or the MRT or LRT, these are casual crowds. Or those people who are walking inside the mall and are not really interacting with each other, these are called casual crowds. Next, we have conventional crowds and those who come together for a scheduled event occurring regularly, like for example, a religious service, a Eucharist, 
are, etc. Next, we also have what we call expressive crowds, and these are crowds uh, of people who join together to express emotions uh, that are functional, like for example, funerals, you know, weddings, or uh, others, no? Uh, the, the cultural events like birthday parties or let's say uh, gender reveal parties although I don't feel so good about gender reveal par parties no, from a soji perspective so there again when you look at conventional crowds and expressive crowds these are people who do a behavior that is institutionalized or positively sanctioned by society you know Eucharist is a part of culture. You know, funerals are part of culture. Weddings are part of culture. Birthday parties, baptisms are part of culture. So they can't be considered as non-institutionalized. They're institutionalized. They're socially sanctioned. So there, they wouldn't be uh, activities that we could consider as collective behaviors because these are institutionalized activities. And that is what these two crowds are different from when we talk about acting crowds. And these are acting, uh, these acting crowds are those that are focused on a specific goal, a cause, an advocacy, or an action such as a protest movement, or you know going aggressive, a riot, or going more aggressive, um, terrorism, war, conflict. So these are um, acting crowds. And then we often also hear. Um, mass and public as terms that are usually changed, interchangeably used, no? Uh, but they are actually sociologically different. Like for example, mass is a relatively large number of people with a common interest, though they may not be in close proximity, such as players of popular Facebook game Farmville. So this is quite an old example, but you know what I mean. And then we also have public, which is an, an organized, relatively diffuse group of people who share the same ideas. Like, for example, political ideas in the States, you know, the public, you have the Republicans and the Democrats. And then for the Philippines, of course, we have the pro-government supporters and we have the uh, opposition. You know? So these are naman the public. Because they're categorized based on political ideas. The mass is basically um, group because of a common interest like for example you have the armies for k-pop you have the athens for sb19 no uh, the fans are also considered as mass now sociology offers us a few explanations why people congregate together towards a cause or towards an advocacy or towards a common goal so under the symbolic interactionist perspective, we have Ralph Turner and Louis Killian, and they explain that in their emergent norm theory, uh, that people perceive and respond to the crowd situation with their particular individual set of norms, which may change as the crowd experience evolves. So traditional norms basically uh, become overthrown, no? When we, uh, when people are put into a situation that needs certain norms and institutional practices to be overturned because of a crisis or because of a problem, like for example, during Typhoon Yolanda, um, people started resorting to looting because you know, um, in uh, in during that time, no, there was a big scarcity of resources in terms of food and necessities. And therefore, when, you know, a small group of people started looting and, you know, they start uh, normalizing that act, you know, people started, you know, joining them in terms of their action, in terms of opening up the stores and looting in the store. So, uh, that's emergent norm theory. So, probably some people who looted in that during that time didn't feel really positive about looting before that but because the situation demands it and the meanings that they attach to the supermarket that they looted has changed you know from something that they have to respect in terms of rules to something that they they saw it now as a need for them to be able to survive and they saw looting not anymore as uh, an activity that's bad but it's actually now an activity for survival and this change of meanings that is amplified by the uh, actions that they observe around them because the crowd is going and you know stealing stuff inside the supermarkets you know it's it's intensified and therefore you know the traditional norms are over overthrown 
and uh, looting has been normalized because of that. Emergent norm theory further posits that once individuals find themselves in a situation ungoverned by previously established norms, like for example, in the looting situation in Yolanda um, Typhoon, uh, they interact in small groups to develop new guidelines on how to behave. So when uh, when it's already a time of crisis, like I said, you know, um, and that uh, they have already been isolated from the other parts of society, the tendency is for them to be able to create a new type of norm, especially if the goal is to be able to survive or to be able to care for their own safety. And therefore, in emergent norm theory, the crowds that do uh, an non-institutionalized activity are not viewed as irrational, impulsive, or uncontrolled groups. Instead, uh, these crowds um, or these norms are developed and are accepted as they fit the situation. And therefore, you know, when we see uh, when we see the explanations that you know some of the BLM protesters who were a little bit in the riot side, you know, who were a little bit in the destruction of property side, um, and when you see how they try to rationalize the behavior, um, it was um, it you could see that the the way they define the norm and the acceptable behavior was changing. Like for example, when we say, you know, when they try to destroy or loot businesses, they would say, oh, because, you know, these corporations, they are very much contributory to why there is suffering in the black community. And therefore that action in the spirit of the protests we're in, we're trying to push back in relation to racial discrimination has become well if not acceptable at least excusable you know so um as as you know crowds um try to decide on a new norm that they're trying to fight for uh and try to make that part of policy and social change you know uh new activities and new meanings and new norms are being included as they see fit from a structural functionalist perspective, we have the work of Smelser in 1962, and according to the value-added theory by Smelser, um, it is posited that several conditions must be in place for collective behavior to occur, and these are the conditions. First, structural conduciveness. When people are aware of the problem and have the opportunity to gather, ideally in an open area, and that's the reason why it's so difficult to, to stage a protest in the Philippines at this moment in time because one well, of course there's pandemic so you know even if mass gathering with um with mass gathering with social distancing could be excused um from a more non-formal um non-formal view it is you know negatively sanctioned because you know you don't want to risk contagion so because it's not structurally conducive for people to gather during this time. We don't see any gathering despite, you know, many precursors or many problems that are very palpable at the moment. Next, structural strain. People's expectations about the situation at hand being unmet, causing tension and strain. So I think um, what better way to explain this is in the context of COVID-19 pandemic wherein, you know, especially when you have so many experts telling you that mass testing is important, that isolation is important, that, you know, good health care is important, and putting people first is important. And then you see in the media that the governments, not only in the Philippines, but for example, in the States, they're doing otherwise. And you would really see that, you know, uh, that will be the cause of the stress and the tension that is collectively shared by people. And that is one precursor for social movements and collective behavior to happen. And again, when you see also what's happening in Lebanon, at the moment wherein there is you know people are uh, taking it into the streets you know they're trying to uh to demand social change because of the big economic problem that they have now after the explosion you would see that the explosion was the tip of the iceberg for uh, was the was the was the main um trigger for them was the last trigger for them um and it was the last straw 
and that basically caused them to you know make everyone feel the tension and everybody is now strained and now people are taking into the streets next is growth and spread of generalized belief wherein a problem is clearly identified and attributed to a person or a group at least in the philippines no a lot of our problems especially in the opposing side are being attached to the government and therefore it's again a precursor for protests to happen you know, for collective behavior to happen etc and then precipitating factors the emergence of a dramatic event no? at least for Lebanon, the dramatic event that we're talking about is the explosion in the pier. No, uh, in the Philippines, we have had so many dramatic events already. You no, know? for example, in the EDSA uh, 1986 revolution, it was um, it was the death of Ninoy Aquino. You know, um, for the EDSA dos, no, it was the the dramatic event was the non um continuance of the impeachment trial against uh Joseph Estrada Edsa Tres naman was the dramatic event was the I am sorry um uh, pronouncement of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo in the uh in the uh in the in the recent you know in the recent few years so for example the dramatic event for the INC um, protest was the um, the issue that was happening in the Iglesia Ni Cristo and the, the action that the Lima was taking and that was a dramatic event for INC to take into the streets you know and then um, you also have in the Philippines you know, in the current you now there are many dramatic events that should have been you know uh, a good enough um, a good enough uh, precipitating event you know to take people into the streets no like for example uh the the burial of uh marcos in the living ng mga bayani and then we also have the death of kian de los santos you know and recently of course we have the the closure of abs cbn these are all precipitating factors it's just um what what just happens is that is that it's not it's not easily sustained no? these protests aren't easily sustained um because um our attentions are easily diverted into a new issue no um so that's the reason why some of the social movements that we have aren't sustained as we would want like them to be sustained next is mobilization for action so there are leaders who emerge to direct a crowd to action and i, I think for at least for edsa 1986 that's noy aquino even eventually after his death it's uh corazon aquino diba? um it's just so ha i think also the one of the reasons why uh social movements aren't so successful at this current stage of the regime is because um there's no like singular a leader that could be looked up to that's credible enough and that's charming enough you know to be able to take people and convince them to take into the street and anyone who's emerging to become that leader is easily tainted by the current um government you not know, the current administration so you would really see a lot of um uh, a lot of political swaying happening um so again unless there's a there's like a uh, a leadership that really is sustainable you know that's the only time we can see you know social movements be sustained and then apparently social control and social control basically ends the collective behavior action so social control you know in the states it's you know uh, and in the philippines you know um, the presence of the police that basically um stops the protesting you know by whatever force that they they, they force upon the protesters you know? so this is basically the end and of course for the arab spring no um the social control was much much um horrifying you know there's we have a lot of uh deaths you know there's a civil war kasi hindi talaga nagpa yung the the problematic leaders in that in that specific situation no? hindi talaga sila nagpatinag no? and then of course we have yung mga um, uh, we have other 
uh, other situations wherein there had been social, you know, strict social control that was a part of the response on collective behavior. Like for example, in Hong Kong, diba? when they were starting having, you know, countrywide um, uh, demonstrations in the area, you know, police presence was heightened and uh, this this has been instrumental to you know the dissipation of the movements that were happening in Hong Kong. Next, let's talk about the assembling perspective that basically also gives more light or gives more effectiveness to the collective behavior. Okay, so the first one is like the the first crowd is is a convergence cluster, or in this are just a group of people who are together. You know, with no agenda. So, for example, family and friends who travel together. Next, we have convergent orientation. Groups that are all facing the same direction. So, for example, when you say, you know, protest movements, usually they just, you know, go and walk in the same direction. Next, we have the collective vocalization. So, this is basically more responsive to what is happening. Like, or, for example, in the Leonidas story of Awu Awu. So, that's an example of your collective vocalization. But they're not really verbalizing anything. Compared to collective verbalization, wherein they're actually uttering collectively uh, in participation of a speech or a song. Like, for example, Maki Baka, Wag Matakot. So that's an example of collective verbalization. Or, for example, in a more um, institutionalized manner, you know, we have, of course, the um, panatang makabayan or the singing of the national anthem. So these are also collective verbalizations. And then we also have collective gesticulation which is uh, usually concerning body parts or forming uh, symbols. No? Like for example, we have yung, uh, of course the iron fist you know, the fist bump symbol of the Duterte or the L symbol of the liberals. And then we have collective manipulation or in their objects that are collectively moved around. You know, like for example, we have the uh, placards or we have the uh, tawag dito, yung mga, uh, mascots and costumes that are being burned. You know? So that's an example of collective manipulation. And we have the collective locomotion wherein there is uh, again a uh, movement that is uh, of the same direction. So, uh, social movements are collective behavior that are purposeful, organized groups striving to work toward a common social goal. Like, for example, we have a local social movement, which is, for example, ousting a local official. That's an example of a local social movement. We have national social movements. We have women and health groups trying to work to able to uh, approve, you know, the Productive Health Act. And then we have global social movements example is your Greenpeace you know? yeah, which is of course all about the caring for the environment now according to Aberl uh, in 1966 there are, there are types of social movements the first type we have the reform movements that seek to change something specific about the social structure so for example uh, higher wage for women no? or uh, tawag dito, longer maternal leaves um, the long uh, existence of a paternity leave, you know, so those are reform movements. You're just selecting a specific area or a specific policy or a specific uh, norm in society that needs to be changed. Or for example, LGBTQ rights or for example, uh, more social safety nets for farmers, kanyan. In comparison to revolutionary movements, it seeks to completely change every aspect of society, usually changing the whole economic system and whole political system. Diba? Like for example, uh, medical, Medicare for all, you know, a more socialist society. So that's an example of a revolutionary movement. You know? An example of a revolutionary movement that we have uh, before is, of course, you know that when we overthrew the Marcos regime with a revolutionary government, uh, through the um, EDSA revolution. And then we also have the religious or redemptive movements that are more of meaning seeking and their goal is to provoke inner change and spiritual growth in the individuals. Like for example, you know, there are certain sects of Catholicism that branched out, you know, for example, Catholicism that branched out yung Protestantism and then we have the born again Christians, you know, and these are protest movements against the church. You know, and trying to change some of the beliefs 
um, that they feel that are not really spiritually grounded. And then there are also alternative movements which are focused on self-improvement and limited to specific changes to individual beliefs and behavior like for example those who promote a vegan lifestyle. These are alternative movements. And then we have resistance movements, those who seek to prevent or undo the change that has been done to the political structure. You know? like, like for example, we have pro, uh, pro-life uh, movements that try to uh, remove the Reproductive Health uh, Act you know, or pro-life movements in the states that are trying to decriminalize again abortion, and then we also have the anti-vaxxer movements, you know, who wants to uh, criminalize, you know, or who wants to uh, uh, uninstitutionalize or remove from the system vaccination. Now, what are stages of the social movements? No, so first, there's an emergence of the social movement. So probably there's a problem or a crisis that has been seen, some rights that have been not regarded to certain individuals, and from there, these people who have the same beliefs will coalesce. They will come together in order for them to uh, have, you know, a collective that has uh, someone to stand for. No. And then, eventually, they will organize and bureaucratize. So, they will form an organization. Like, for example, magiging silang like Gabriela. So, there's a group of women or a group of people who were for uh, women's rights. No, So, they coalesced into a group and then they formalized into a group that is now a political party. So, we have the Gabriela. Uh, and then, we also have, you know, um, the uh, people who fight for LGBTQIA rights and then they group together then they become you know a political party we have Dalad Lad and then we also have a more um, protest related uh, organization which is the Manila Pride you know? so ayon now these are the different ways that they could end up after you know organizing you know? they could have be successful and you know get the rights and get the social change that they want to see it could be failure you know so they they don't get to see uh, the, the social change that they want you know uh, there are bigger groups that were able to topple them down you know uh, co-optation meaning uh, they try to negotiate you know uh, with the current social structure and just accept it as it is uh, we have repression where in you know yun nga, bigger groups are trying to repress them from speaking you know uh, so certain policies that are being uh, uh, passed in order for them to not be able to continue their social movements or they could go mainstream you know uh, be more uh, be more palpable in the media etc etc and then eventually if uh, whatever their output was you know they will eventually decline in nature Siyempre, if they've been successful then there might not be that much need for the organization to be as active as they was and of course if they fail or if they were repressed then magde decline na sila or if they went mainstream they become uh, uh they become part of uh the the uh the actual social structure then basically the movements will decline and then of course there's an emergence of what we call online social movements or what we call clicktivism or slacktivism which basically is a social movement that is done online. When I originally made this PowerPoint, I was really more against it because uh, I feel like there's really more that you can do when you take to the streets all the advocacies and causes that you're fighting for. But at the moment, especially that we are forced to be quarantined or locked down in our houses, I think this is the best bet that we have as of now. And of course, the there is uh, there are a lot of things that you have to consider and that are considered here because, you know, um, with the movements that we do in social media are also very much dependent on the platform that we're using whether it's twitter or facebook and we are always at the mercy of whatever algorithm it has no? so uh, there are many ways that this is done of course you make a hashtag trend you know which is again not very uh, effective because we also see a lot of um a lot of trolls <laughs> that also are trying to 
um, to fight their own hashtags and therefore trying to dilute the messages of propaganda and uh, they're also what we call sabotage sabotaging no like for example you know in the recent uh, activities that um, that are being done by K-pop groups, but right? they are trying to flood, you know, fan camps on certain um, trending um, uh, hashtags, uh, so that the harmful messages that are brought about by the propaganda of the hashtags are being watered down. And another common would be, you know, large celebrities with really attractive algorithms uh, share their platform into their um if for people whose voices need to be heard like for example taylor swift she's lending her account you now she's giving her password to uh black activists in order for them to have a more wider reach and of course we have you know donations is also a form of helping the social movements and also we have the platforming of people and celebrities and personalities who are known to be um, very offensive um, some would say cancel culture and but I do believe that there's a lot of loopholes in terms of doing cancel culture because a lot of those that have been canceled aren't really the platform you know so um, that's also an example of a social movement Next, another theory on social movements is resource mobilization. So it's very important that, you know, we have to remember that social movements is also an organized activity and all organized activity need resources. No? It's either human resources, political resources, economic resources in order for it to fly. So social movements compete for our attention with other concerns and with each other. Diba? Like for example, somewhere you see PETA who's also asking for your donations, right? And you see Greenpeace, it's also asking for your donations. You know, LGBTQIA groups are also asking your donations. So Black Lives Matter is also asking for donations. You know, Piston 5, 7 is also asking for your donations. So there's so many, um, there's so many protest groups, there's so many social movements. And, you know, uh, from a st standpoint of the one who's organizing these movements, you also have to think that, you know, aside from me, there are also other social movements. So how do I make sure that I am able to get enough human resources and economic resources in order for me to be able to be effective? So this is what resource mobilization is trying to explain. The ability to acquire resources and mobilize individuals predicts the success of social movements. So if you get, you know, a celebrity that can, of course, um, amplify the voice of your social movement, that would be great because that increases your marketability. Sometimes, you know, we use marketing strategies, advertisement strategies on social movements just because we want to be able to as amass as much resources as possible and these resources will basically predict our success as a social movement. Those that aren't as much as, as marketed or as promoted, those that, that do not get a big enough number, doesn't, doesn't get a critical mass, usually they just fade and we're not, are not able to achieve what they want to achieve as a social movement. So in the social movement sector, the social movement industry, um, and social movement organization are very, very important. No? So social movements in industry, that's why we have um, a specific program developers, you know. There's a training for program developers and NGOs because, you know, you really have to get sponsorships and resources in order for you to fly as a social movement. So in order for you to get people to you know be a part of your social movement how should you frame your messages in order to get them you know so one could be diagnostic framing which basically states the problem in a clear and easily understood way for example um hiv is a deadly disease but it's it's preventable you know and it could be also prognosis framing which basically looks into offering a solution and states how it will be implemented. So it's really more methods. And then we have motivational framings, more of a call to action. What should you do once you agree with the diagnostic frame and believe in the prognostic frame? So this is basically the three frames that, uh, a, that a certain social movement must do. So for example, you know, many people 
die every day because of HIV. So that's the agnostic framing. And in order for us to be able to save these lives, we have to educate them about testing and available uh, available treatment. So that's prognosis framing. And therefore, we believe that you, the youth, are very much um, energetic and very charming in order to convince people to have themselves tested and have themselves be uh, enrolled for treatment. You know? And when you see the, how feisty and young and energetic you are about your um, advocacies, they will uh, be enticed with your work. So, yon. so these, are the, these are ways. Of course, I did it very poorly. But uh, when you look at you know different um, invitational in videos uh, for NGOs, you would really see that these three are present among them. And then finally, we move to social change. So what is social change? It's a change in society created through social movements as well as other external factors like environmental shifts or technological innovations. Like for example, first, technology. You know, it causes social change. You no. Know? Um, a lot of our social interactions that used to be face to face now could be delegated um, digitally, you know, even before the pandemic. Uh, changes in social institutions, like for example, um, there is now a decreasing um, influence of the church and religion in our society. So that is a cause for you know more individualism more secularism in our society so that's another form of social change another cause of social change would be the population diba? so uh, in developed countries they have lesser young people and more aging population and because of that you know their norms also change there's an increased um, development of geriatric care facilities for old people there is there are policies to entice you know couples to bear children you know because they have a low fertility rate you know and in the underdeveloped countries there is an increasing you know population and therefore you know um from after 10 years or more than a decade of fighting for um reproductive health uh accessibility in the philippines we had to you know, we had to say yes to the Reproductive Health Act so that we can control overpopulation in the Philippines. And then we have the environment. You know, the changes in the environment also changed us. Like, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic. An example of, you know, how the uh, biological changes in our environment can change, basically, there the, are norms and values in society and of course modernization we have explained this you know in our many ex, uh, explanation in the ch in the development of society in the globalization so this is the part that increases the amount of specialization and differentiation of structure in societies and which are also very much correlated to these things but of course you know in this um, specific video we also say that one way that we can achieve social change is through social movements and we we have demonstrated that in the EDSA 1986 revolution we have demonstrated that in the civil wars that have happened in the west we have demonstrated that in uh, in the breaking down of the USSR of the Berlin Wall uh, we have demonstrated that in um, and we've seen that being demonstrated in other places like for example in Hong Kong diba? although of course uh, there's still a long way to go in terms of their demonstrations there we see that in so many um, so many places right now how societies can change because of social movements and, uh, and I think that's a very important lesson that I have to impart here is that you know as citizens of this country as humans in the world with a shared humanity and there's a universal understanding of rights you know um us who belong to a privileged sector of society you know we have that responsibility to have our voices heard you know because that is also our right you know that is granted to us not only by the universal declaration of rights but also by our very constitution and to may be able to make use of our voice our platform our influence in order for us to be able to fight for 
the, those who can't fight for themselves and i think that's very important um especially to those who are you know exposed to sociology and how different social institutions social sectors and different groups organizations and you know how racial discrimination gender discrimination sexuality related discrimination now ageism and ableism and classism how these are you know hurting our society especially those who are in the margins and i think you know us who are now more socially aware about how society can contribute to these problems and the possibility of how society could be changed and reshaped in order for everyone to have better quality of life you know have good social safety nets especially for the people who are in the margins who are poor you know and who are discriminated in this society uh, not just in this country but all over the world to have a better life for them and um, I think that's that's basically what I want you to uh, take home after all of this discussions in, in society in introduction to sociology is to be more socially aware and to be socially participative Ayon. So in this video, we were able to define and describe collective behaviors, why they happen. We also described the different understandings and theories on social movements. And we also um, briefly described social change and how different factors, including social movements, can contribute to social change.